Why Study Theology by Donald Luck. It is not surprising that like political debate and scientific investigation, theology's work is never done, and its results are never agreed on by everyone. But what matters is that the work be carried on, the, that differing points of view make careful cases and seek a hearing in the Christian community so that its belief and practice can be informed and helped. Someone said, life is a journey and not a destination. What is increasingly evident in our own day is that theology is being viewed in the same way. In the past, it often seemed that theology dealt with a timeless truth that only had to be re-expressed again and again. This approach is called theoretical repristination, that, but exact actual theology has always embraced a great deal of historical dynamism, even if this dynamism was not consciously recognized until the last few centuries. Contact with Arabs in the High Middle Ages introduced Europeans to large segments of Aristotle's writings that had been lost in the West. These ideas revolutionized Western philosophy and thereby created totally new theology. The cultural movement of the Renaissance stressed the importance of going back to original sources and understanding them in their original languages. The resulting study of scripture in Greek and Hebrew rather than in Latin translation has a profound effect on theology and helped create the Reformation. The rise of modern science and its challenges to Christian tradition stimulated radically new theological approaches, and today some argue that recognition of a global pluralistic and environmentally threatened world calls for a new way of thinking theologically. Right now, for example, there is interest in what sorts of new Christian theology will emerge from the churches that have been planted in African and Asian cultures and that increasingly feel at home there. So, the work of theology is never over. But that does not invalidate past results any more than it means that former arguments are a waste of time. The theological process itself is important, and its results, results, even though limited and subject to challenge, can have significant value. Sometimes the insights that were gained in the past turn out to have new relevance and a creative impact. Consequently, theology continues to interact with the historically and culturally new at the same time that it remi reminds itself of its past. All this is to say... Theology is a process. There is no doubt about the intimidating, overwhelming effect theology can have on the beginning reader. Its language can seem es esoteric, its arguments complex, and its work distinctions highly refined and its practical usefulness obscure. Little wonder persons can be put off by it. Sometimes theologians seem to argue about wispy and irrelevant topics. The great Renaissance scholar Erasmus is credited with criticizing the picky concerns and convoluting arguments of medieval scholastic theologians by charging that they argued about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. Then along came the Lutheran and Calvinist scholastics in the 17th century. At times their writing seems just as bad, as if the former wondered whether angels danced at all, and the latter asked whether, even if they were capable of doing so, they should be allowed to. I believe that theologians need to admit that something like this often takes place today. The reasons lie in the wider intellectual climate. Theology has been under great pressure by the world of scholarship to demonstrate that it has an intellectual respectability. The academy, as the world of discipline, study, and arguments is often called, has put great pressure on theologians who have often been accused by secular intellectuals of dealing with little more than refined superstition or insupportable private notions based on nothing more than emotion. Consequently, theology has made a strenuous defense of the intellectual vigor and integrity of Christian faith and life, but the result has many times been a crafting of theology more in conversation with the academy than with the believing community. This has tended to focus theology on concerns that lie far afield of where churchgoers live. Even more problematically, it has led some Christian scholars to stop being theologians, speaking for and to the church. Instead, this challenge has encouraged them to analyze Christian faith and life as dispassionate academic scholars who are interested in religion in a professional and generic fashion. For some, this switch in focus has been co coextensive with their own loss of personal faith. The overall result is to distance certain segments of theological discourse from the life of the church and to pursue more and more academically question specialized questions. It will take a while, but eventually beginning students of theology can begin to recognize theology that is addressed primarily to the academy and that which is addressed primarily to the church. It will be easier to follow the latter, but they should not avoid intellectually 
demanding theological writing. In fact, from the earliest theology produced by the Christian community, theologians have believed that it was not only fruitful, but also an expression of faithfulness to God to be accountable to both communities. In part, it is because allowing ourselves to be stretched intellectually can be understood by Christians to be a form of discipleship, a placing of oneself under God as the foundation and goal of all understanding, but we all need to find our own pl pace. Above all, we shouldn't let our understandable frustration cause us to dismiss a particular work or even theology in general as worthless. In the last chapter, we will explore in detail some of the educational implications of developmental psychology. That discipline argues that the process of intellectual growth and the parallel processes of moral and religious growth follow definite patterns. The overall direction of such growth is an increasingly discovery and acceptance of the complex and constantly changing character of life. If we are presented with ideas that lie well beyond the range of what we already know and accept, we will be intimidated by them. In such a situation, the very certainty with which such ideas are presented will tend to anger us. That is because we can feel humiliated by the distance between ourselves and others who understand more than we do or who argue more successfully or knowledgeably than we. But these psychological studies have also shown that when we encounter ideas and values that are more nuanced than our own, but which we can come to understand by stretching our understanding just a bit, we can grow. This means that part of the responsibility for effective communication rests with teachers and theologians. They should not get too far out in front of the given understanding of others they want to teach. They need to know their audience and speak a word in season. But part of the responsibility is also the students. As a student, you shouldn't expect every teacher or theologian to shape his or her presentations just to meet you where you are. Consequently, you need to be self-selecting in what you study and read, but as you do, you will need to be willing to let your understanding reach out from where it is already. And you need to admit that theology is a lot more to com in communicate than you will be able to grasp, even by stretching yourself. At the same time, it, th that is not an implicit criticism of you any more than it is a dismissal of what these theologians are saying. Certainly, this is true for any other subject. High school students beginning studies in physics can hardly expect themselves to understand the doctoral lectures given at MIT, and it is no disparagement of them that they can't. Why shouldn't it be different for theology? Perhaps because theology affects the dearly held beliefs of people that expect it should be otherwise. But even though theology is believing thinking as much as it is thinking and believing, it still remains thinking. It is an academic subject, even when pursued by the church for the sake of the church. So, the watchword is patience. Be patient with yourself as you carry out this path of study. Be patient when you can't understand what someone is saying, especially when your psyche starts to feel frustration and lashes out an angry dismissal. Help it to be understanding and realistic. Be patient with yourself for the time it takes you for your understanding to expand. Give yourself the credit you deserve for the progress you do make and the attitude of openness and hard work you display. And be patient with the obscure, to you, arguments you encounter in theological writings. It is usually the case that you are overhearing a conversation that has been going on for a long time. If you as an outsider heard persons talking about family matters, you would not be surprised that you didn't understand some, if not most, of the references they made. You wouldn't know what Aunt Lena's usual attitude meant. You wouldn't even know anything about Aunt Lena. And while you might be able to understand a bit of what they were saying, you would be totally in the dark if suddenly they switched to speaking in Slovak, the family language. Much theology is like that. You are overhearing a conversation that has been going on for a long time and has many operating assumptions to it. Moreover, the language that is used is actually a high technical language that not only comprises a special vocabulary, but uses what looks like ordinary English in its own way. Theologians don't do this to be difficult. Sometimes, it is true, they have a tendency to slip into what almost seems like a foreign language, one I call academies. It's a style of communication that tries to convey to other members of the academy the understanding that the author is highly knowledgeable about the issues and all related arguments is widely read, cognizant of contrary views, and skilled at making arguments. As a theologian, I plead guilty to the charge myself. And the results can be very disappointing. Too many theologians write for, for other theologians, and too few for a widest possible audience. But once again, have patience, and be understanding of your frame of reference seems to be ignored. At the same time, 
realize that because it is a technical language, theology uses a kind of shorthand. Once you come to understand the meaning of technical terms, and once you know the background for points of view and their competing alternatives, you will understand passages and entire essays that use to confuse and frustrate you. Take, for example, the following sentence from Dutch theologian J.C. Hokendijk. Eschatology cannot be more than a single paragraph from Christology. The messianic dealings with the world, in a few sentences from eschatology, the messianic dealings with the world. It would take several pages to spell out all that this one sentence is attempting to argue. Let me only call attention to a few of its more important elements. In the first first place, it is a bold, even outrageous statement, since it flies in the face of what many persons believe, and what most theologians in the past have assumed. He is referring to eschatology. That's the technical term for the Christian understanding of the nature, meaning, and value of the church. Moreover, he is offering this not as a description of the way the church is, but as a prescription. He means it to argue of how God sees the church, and what the church is meant to be from that perspective. What he is asserting is that the concern for the church in and of itself is the wrong concern altogether. Anything having to do with the church as God intends it really belongs to two other considerations, Christology and eschatology. Christology usually refers to understanding the person of Jesus Christ and how Christ is related both to the humanness he shares with us and to God's divinity. But he doesn't mean it simply in that traditional sense. He's referring to what Jesus Christ means to God's concern for the world and God's saving impact upon it. The Christology he's referring to is not metaphysical. That is, it doesn't deal abstractly with the human nature and the nature of the divine and how they intersect with each other in the person of Christ. Instead, his Christology is existential. That is, it refers to the life-shaping meaning and spiritual impact that Christ has for the believing community and its individual members. Eschatology traditionally refers to Christians' understanding of the relation of salvation to time and more narrowly to the end of the world and eternal life. In the 20th century, however, eschatology is viewed not as a separate topic, but as an issue that intersects with the whole of Christian faith and life. And rather than referring to something in the future, eschatology is concerned with how God's presence and will intersect with the present. The promise of God's ultimate future profoundly shapes the way Christians live now. Consequently, concern about the church should be grounded in the final outcome of God's will, which will affect not simply the church, but the entire human family, even the entire universe. So, what Hokendich is arguing is rather radical. A church concerned about itself is not the church God wants. God's saving presence and will are not focused on the church or restricted to the church. The next sentence makes his argument clear. The church is only the church to the extent that she lets herself be used as part of God's dealings with the okumene. That last word is a New Testament Greek word that means the entire inhabited world. So God's saving will is focused not on the church, but on the world. And the church's God-grounded meaning is realized when it mirrors the servant's character of its Lord. The church exists not to be concerned about itself, but solely to be like Christ in being responsive to God's saving will for the entire world. Perhaps now you will understand something of the implications of the title of the book from which this quote comes. The church turned inside out. It has taken a great deal of explanation to unpack just one sentence of theology and to do so in only a minimal way. But this illustration can help you understand how theology's technical language is a kind of shorthand and how the ongoing conversation of theology in our century provides the context for understanding how even traditional terms are used. So be patient with yourself and with the material you read and be persistent. Like any other field of study, from car mechanics to quantum physics, theology requires persistent and solid work. But... Others before you have responded to this challenge, and they have not only managed, they have become personally involved. They have found that theology has changed them. Summary. The American di disposition tends to dismiss dealing with ideas, but ideas are real and reshaping of life depends on them. The same holds true for the Church of Understanding of its own faith and mission. By abstracting from the concrete, in in intellectuals are able to provide perspectives for reshaping and redirecting what human beings are believe, and do. Theology is the exercise of this discipline on behalf of the church. Thinking abstractly is a skill that must be learned, and it is a natural inclination that comes more readily to some, but willingness to, to learn can enable all to discover more fully the reality, power, and excitement of ideas. Like politics, theology is never final, but the discussion itself guides concrete policy because it occurs in relationship to the dynamic character of life itself. 
Theology is called upon to speak a faithful and timely word, not a final one. Theology uses a technical language that requires getting used to, and sometimes this language is addressed more to the academy than to the church. Therefore, learn to be patient with yourself and the theologians you encounter in your study, appreciating your own efforts and the insights you gain from others. For further reading and reflection, go back to go back and review Hogan Deke's statement. Do you agree with what he says, and if so, why do you respond this way? Do you find this assertion challenging, opening up an entirely new way to think about the church? Can you begin to see how taking this theological argument seriously might bring about changes in the ways in which congregations and the church as a whole might rethink their priorities and deploy their energies? The purpose of this example from from Hogendijk was to illustrate the argument that ideas are real and that they have the potential to change things. It also was designed to illustrate how abstracting a perspective by means of intellectual analysis enables us to enter back into the concrete flow of life in order to reshape it or even create something new. If Hogendijk is right, what practical consequences can you see flowing out of his looking at the church in the way he does? What changes in the church's attitude, priorities, and activities might occur? My argument for the value of theory and coherent with the American concern for the practical. My point is to demonstrate that intellectualizing and theorizing have important practical consequences. This time, this isn't the time to elaborate on arguments for the inerrant value of theory, but I do want to signal at this point that there are rewards and claims for intellectual abstraction other than pragmatic ones. Something of this will be touched on later, but you ought to know that there have been theologians, for example, who have asserted that trying to understand the meaning of the Trinity has led them to states of mystic awe and worship. Knowing something about God is an end in in and of itself. But the simple point remains. Ideas are real and the construction of Christian theory that is known as theology has value.